Heavenly Father, we beseech thee. I kneel before you as a member of this age-old craft, praying to you for guidance as I am on a journey. A journey for more light, but more especially light that has been lost, forgotten, or hidden among the ages gone by. The light that connects us with our very meaning and informs us of our purpose. Light locked deep within our past, beyond lips that no longer speak, and paths forgotten, no longer traveled. Aid me in my pursuit, Lord, for historical light. Hey everybody, welcome back to Historical Light, an independent Masonic show focused on the historical events and aspects within Freemasonry. As always, I'm your host, Brother Alex Powers, and I want to thank you for joining us again today. Today is episode number 21, and we have Brother Mitch Denning from Tennessee on the show. If you remember a couple episodes ago, we shared a video documentary he did for his lodge's 150th anniversary, and uh, we have him on the show today so we can talk to him in person, get some uh, more information on that, and possibly... Give some ways that you can do one of those for your lodge. So you're definitely in for a treat today. Want to stick around for that. But let's go ahead and start the show off like we always do. Jump over to our friends at masonrytoday.com and see just what happened in Masonic history today. All right, today in Masonic history, Leon Abbott passes away in 1894. Leon Abbott was an American politician who was born October 8th, 1836 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He attended Central High School and graduated in 1853. Then in 1858, he was admitted to the bar and in 1861 moved to New York City to open a legal practice. In 1862, he would move to Hoboken, New Jersey. I hope I pronounced that correctly. In 1864, Abbott entered the state politics and was elected as a Democrat to the New Jersey General Assembly. He served there from 1864 to 1866 and again in 1869 to 1870. In his second term in the General Assembly, he was the Speaker of the House. In 1875, he was also elected to the New Jersey State Senate, where he served there until 1877. He was President of the Senate in 1877. In 1883, Abbott was elected to his first of two non-consecutive terms as Governor of New Jersey. The second was in 1889. Abbott was commonly and endearingly known as the Great Commoner. His popularity with the urban lower class and the poor farm communities was extremely high. This was largely in part due to the frustration of those who had been demoralized by big business and concentrated wealth. He worked to voice the concerns of the common man who had been oppressed by unrestrained capitalism and special privilege. Abbott pushed through a series of laws that made him unpopular with big business. These included wage standards, maximum work hours, and occupational and safety standards. Abbott also attempted to tax the railroad. He was successful, although he paid an extremely high political cost. He would run for the United States Senate twice and would be defeated both times, largely due by the influence of the railroad industry. In 1893, Abbott was appointed to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Abbott passed away on December 4th in 1894 due to a sudden attack of diabetes. He was a member of Mystic Thai Lodge No. 272 in New York City, New York. Later, he would affiliate with Varick Lodge No. 31 in Jersey City, New Jersey. He was also a member of Ancient Chapter No. 1, New York City, New York, Royal Arch Masons. All right, well, thank you to our friends over at MasonryDay.com for another great article. Definitely check them out at their website and also on social media and subscribe so you can keep up with those great Masonic history articles they do on a daily basis. Now, let's go ahead and jump over and pay the bills. Today's episode is brought to you in part by our sponsor, Masonic Revival. If you haven't checked them out before, do so right after the show today at their website, MasonicRevival.com. You're going to find a great source there of Masonic bow ties, neckties, lapel pins, and much more. And if you like what you see, 
we have a custom promo code just for the show for you. It's going to be all caps, one word, H light. If you use that today, you'll get free shipping on your entire order. So definitely jump over to MasonicRevival.com after the show today and pick you up some great Masonic goods. The show's also brought to you in part by viewers like you. So if you like what you see here and want to support the show, see us continue and grow, you can do that by going to our website, historicallight.com, clicking on the Support Us tab up in the main menu bar, and you can give on a one-time basis or a monthly basis safely and securely through the means of PayPal. We definitely appreciate anything you're willing to give there. Now, we're also trying a new way. Uh, if you notice on our website, we have a shop section. Uh, currently, you can get logo shirts and lapel pins for Historical Light, and we also have a Masonic Antique section. Uh, just recently, we put up some old Masonic coins, and those went really well, and uh, we're going to try to continue that and put those up as another way uh, to offer you value and also bring uh, money into the show to help uh, offset the cost of the website, audio podcast, hosting, and a just general upkeep of the equipment over time. Um, so if you guys have any like old Masonic lapel pins or coins and stuff that you're not doing anything with, just kind of sitting in a drawer, you might consider gifting those to the show. We would put those up on the shop section and the proceeds would go to those same reasons to uh, help offset the cost of the show and can keep us going and continuing over time. So definitely consider that. If you guys have anything, shoot me an email, alex at historicallight.com, and I'll get the information of how you can send those in. Uh, like I said, we appreciate everything you guys are willing to offer and for keeping us around and keeping the lights on for 21 episodes now and going. So thank you guys so much from the bottom of our heart. Um, we also need to mention today, now that bills are paid, um, last episode we did a giveaway uh, for episode number 20. Uh, we had a whole bunch of emails come in, so we took all those, compiled them into a list, and put them into a random name picker online, and we're proud to announce that Brother Mike Russell's name came up. So, Brother Mike Russell, I shot you an email just a little bit ago today. Uh, definitely keep your eyes out. We're going to have a package coming your way very soon, special gifts for you from Historical Light. So thank you guys so much for participating and your support of the show. Uh, you guys mean the world to us. We're around because of you. So thank you guys so much. We're going to do a giveaway again soon, so definitely keep your eyes out for that. So thank you guys for everything you do to keep us around. And with that, let's go ahead and jump into the interview today, which is going to be with Brother Mitch Denning from Tennessee. I hope you enjoy. Welcome back to Historical Light. Very pleased to have Denny on the show today. And Brother Mitch, if you don't mind, I'll go and hand it over to you if you want to give us a little bit of background information in front of mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm Mitch Denning. I'm a member of Portland Lodge, number 326, here in uh, Tennessee. I've been a Mason since I was 19. I was raised a uh, Master Mason in 2015. Wonderful. Now, Brother, do you have any family history within Freemasonry? Um, I do. I don't know exactly how far back it, uh, it goes in my family, but uh, definitely my grandfather has told me that it goes many, many generations back. Very cool. Very cool. Now, is that something you knew about uh, previously, or is that what caused you to want to join Freemasonry, or what is it that made that leap into the fraternity? Um, well, no. I, I knew my grandfather was a Mason, but what made me want to become a Mason was in a college fraternity in at Middle Tennessee State University and I knew that the I was very in, intrigued on the uh, esoteric side of it and the initiation process and I wanted to you know know more about where that came from and then I learned that college fraternities is influenced by masonry so I then asked my grandfather about it and he gave me a petition and here I am today very cool. Well, we're definitely glad you uh, made the leap and decided to join the fraternity. Now, the main reason we have you on today is we, just in an episode not too long ago, uh, focused on a documentary you did for your lodge, and it came across very well done and very powerful. So I want to thank you for taking the time to preserve that history and put your craft into this craft and uh, really put that out there. Um, but if you don't mind, we'll kind of jump into that as the main topic and go through why you decided to do that and kind of your overall experience with it. Uh, came up with the idea to make a, kind of a 
historic background for Portland Lodge. Now, I, at the time I came up with the idea, I had no idea that our 150th anniversary was coming up. Mm. So, like the very next meeting we had, I presented presented it to the lodge just to see if they would be okay with me proceeding with that idea. And they said, sure, I'd be fine with that. It sounds an interesting idea. Uh, I guess about a month after that, uh, a brother started coming to Portland Lodge that I had met at, at the Nashville Grand Lodge at a Scottish Rite meeting. Okay. And his name is Boo McAfee. And he, uh, he started coming to Portland, and I told him my idea. I had no idea his background in the entertainment business. Then he started telling me he's been you know, around, knows a lot about it, and wanted to help. And really, it would not have been able to come to fruition without him. And he, we scheduled meetings, and that's how the kind of the idea and the process got started. We started meeting at the uh, Portland Public Library and found a lot of information. And the movie started just making itself pretty sure. much because the the more we found the people that we were interviewing, it just connected so well, and it just it just happened. Right. Now, that's very cool. You said you didn't even know that the 150 was coming up when you started this, yet this was like the perfect project for a 150. And what caught my attention so much is it was for the 150, and my lodge's 150 is coming up this next year. And I was, once I saw it, I was like, wow, we've got to pull this off. And that kind of got you and me into conversations with it. Um, you did an amazing job on it. Now, going into it, did you have film background uh, before this, or did you just jump into this full force and say, I'm going to figure this out? Um, well, my degree from Middle Tennessee State University is a film and video degree. So okay. this is what, I, this is what I, I've wanted to do since I was a junior in high school, is just make films. So I got a degree in it, and I learned, learned a lot in uh, college. A lot has to do with you know, sound has to be there, um, framing up a shot. But yeah, that... that that would be my background, and film and video would be my college degree. Very cool. Well, that's definitely uh, an amazing point because, you know, we bring brothers in, and it's, you know, it's often asking, well, what can you bring to the lodge, and what can you do? And this, this is a wonderful way that you've taken a gift that you have and a talent that you have and found a very interesting uh, and modern way to introduce that into what we do as a lodge and uh, really bring that history back to life, which we totally appreciate here on this show. Now... What all did you learn uh, as far as the, the history of your lodge getting into this? Were you very in-depth with the history before, or was this just groundbreaking for you? A lot of it was groundbreaking, and a lot of it was just just people thinking they know what has happened. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They, I talked to a bunch of people like, hey, do you know what the, found, the founding of this lodge, like what happened? And then one person would tell me one thing, and somebody else would tell me another thing. Mm -hmm. So me, uh, Boo and I, we we said, hey, we can't do it like this. We have to go do research at on our own, go to the public library and figure out what happened. Well, what we found was that there's a cemetery that still there right now. Sure. The, the building that was at the cemetery is no no longer in existence, but. We had an agreement. Portland Lodge was formally Fountainhead Lodge because it was in the small town of Fountainhead. But at that time, it was much bigger than Portland. And we they had an agreement with the uh, Methodist Church there that sat on that cemetery. And they met in the second story of that that building. And as far as we know, nobody knew that except for one person that we interviewed named Patrick McGuire. He pretty much took us to that site, and he explained everything. And then as we started doing more research for ourselves, we found documents and stuff that proved it. So it was just it was an amazing experience to find. That's why the beginning of the film spent so much time just on that cemetery, was because that was one thing nobody knew about. Right. And I noticed that you had some really cool shots there. Now, did you use a drone in the beginning of that, that, that really cool kind of downward shot? 
I, I did. I uh, recently had got a drone. I hadn't purchased a drone before I started making this film, and in the middle, uh, about summer, I purchased a drone, and I knew I had to. I had to get some shots of that cemetery. Very too. cool. Well, yeah, you you definitely captured some awesome history going into that. You touched on the point of wanting to, you know, obviously cover the history, and you've got different aspects or different versions of the history coming forth. Any Masonic historian out there can feel your pain on that. We, we've all been there, um, and that's something you know I've been working with with our lodge as well. Um, when they covered the hundred year anniversary and kind of wanted to bring the history up to date. Uh, it seemed like a lot of the history wasn't available at the time for whatever reason, and a lot of it was heavily dependent on uh, memories of either older townspeople or you know the older people still left the lodge, and yeah, you know memory varies a little bit, so it is definitely important to do that footwork that you did and actually say, okay, opinions aside, let's let's actually find out what history records on this. So definitely commend you for doing that. Now, is this something you have looked at doing with other lodges, or you know, is this kind of your one video experience for masonry? Um, I would be up to uh, help other people out make this for themselves. Um, definitely, would love to even possibly do it for another lodge if they have the information available to them. Um, I, I would like to work alongside someone to right. uh, get the kind of the ball rolling on some history of their lodge because I, a lot of you said that a lot of the information is not available yeah. because and we ran into that there's a there's a gap we found a a minute book at our lodge back from the 1800s to 1920 something i can't remember exactly the date but there's a gap after that and it doesn't start back again until 1940s 50s so okay. there's like a 20 year period that we don't have and it might be at some of these lodges so if a bunch of these lodges get together around each other so you're whatever district you're in if you get together and start working on these history projects you might actually find some history of each other's lodges at your own lodge yeah, that's that's a great point. I've I've uh, found that a lot in doing research with my lodge. That you know we're kind of in a rural part of Kansas, so you've got a couple other lodges in surrounding communities. But it's awesome to see how much they traveled and how much they actually intermingled um, back in those days. Now, going through and starting this research, um, you had some really cool sources on there. It looked like uh, you had a local historian. Uh, you had someone from the historical society. I think was on there. Um, were these people that were previously involved in the history of your lodge, or did you seek them out for this project? Like I said in the beginning, the film started just making itself. So sure. when, we, when we started going to uh, the Portland Public Library, we met Paula Shannon, and she works at the library, so she was there. But come to find out, one of her ancestors uh, created a, was T.L. Lanier, Brother T.L. Lanier, Okay. And he, he uh, there was a period in time where Portland Lodge didn't, I can't remember if it was Fountain Head Lodge at the time or if it was already Portland Lodge. I don't think it was. I think they moved to this place and then changed the name. But her ancestor gave the lodge a place to meet for about a year. Uh, and then they moved pretty much across the street from his building after that. And uh, that was T.L. Lanier. So we had no idea that that was even her ancestor. And she's big in the history part of anything and that deals with Portland anyway. And it was just awesome to find that out. So no, she was not connected to us before we started making this film. But when we started meeting at the Portland Public Library, getting more people on that was working there, she was like, hey, so I was looking at it and I found that my ancestor was a big played a big role in the fraternity and then she started looking into into it for herself and then we found a bunch more information on T.L. Lanier's side of it and his venture into Portland in the Fountainhead area. Wonderful. Now the other aspect I really liked of this, you know, I, I kind of dabbled with the idea of it previously but never in the aspect of doing a documentary like you did. Um, when we're trying to recover and preserve the history within our lodges, one thing that I've pushed for a long time is use modern means. 
we have video and audio so freely accessible to us today, which you know in the past was just not there. It's, it's one thing to have memories written down from our past masters, but it's another thing to have those brought to life and to use those modern means. So it's, it's been something I've pushed for a while to, hey, video interview your past masters, video interview just the older members of your lodge, any members of your lodge, get their experiences, you know, their memories and all that, you know, on audio, on video, so you have their personality stored and that alive. Um, but to bring it into the aspect of actually doing a documentary, just never even like occurred to me. It went over so perfectly. What was the reaction when this was all said and done um, by your lodge? Were they, uh, you know, ecstatic to have this preserved, or what was their initial thoughts on it? Oh, they were, they were thrilled. And we had the 150th anniversary event. We had a chili cook-off, um, packed house. I mean, that's sure. The, the most people I've seen at our lodge since I've been in. But um, and I didn't want to take all the credit for that because right. I mean, it was just it was the lodge and just it, Boo and I we found so much about the fraternity that we just we're giving that back. That's all we were doing. Right. And no credit taken for us at all. But it was just amazing to see it come to flourishion and the reaction for the brothers. They. It, it was well received. I could say that. It well talked about after the fact, and um, raised a lot of questions, which I like to do. I like sure. to raise a lot of questions. So definitely, yeah, definitely well received. And you, uh, you said to use modern technology to your advantage. A lot of people don't realize, like you don't need big equipment to even make a film. So a lot of the right. the majority of the audio. I used <clears throat> during these interviews was my phone. Just go to your little uh, microphone, your voice memo app on your phone, and put it in somebody's pocket with the like turned upside down, so the microphone is right there, and it's amazing audio. You will be surprised how good of audio you can get with just your phone and video nowadays. I mean, that's getting better too, but. That's yeah, a great point. Yeah. I mean, technology is, uh, it, it's getting more and more accessible and more and more cheap and you know, easy to obtain. And there's, there's really just no reason not to implement it. Um, we're not stuck in the 1800s anymore. So just to have the same minute books they had back then is really doing a disservice and a discredit to, uh, to our brethren of now and the future. Um, you know, right. I've said it a hundred times before, minute books are great and we rely on them so much as Masonic historians, but when it comes down to it, a minute book tells you about that much of the true history. It gives you none of the feeling, gives you none of the side story. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, we're not saying to bring video into the lodge, but bring right. video into your membership, you know, keep right. your members alive because your members are the ones that give the personality to your lodge and, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, worth it to invest that time and experience into it. Now you're saying, you know, it, it's so easy to use a phone and stuff. There's a lot of brothers still that are very uh, intimidated, I guess, uh, of modern technology. How how hard would it be for somebody? You know, I mean, your your video is very polished, but how hard would it be for somebody uh, with limited technical uh, experience to record something on their phone and maybe edit it together, and preserve this in some kind of a manner? I mean not very hard at all. I mean, you could do it right there on your phone uh, inside the voice memo app. Uh, of course, you would just have audio at that point, but if you had a, uh, a camera set up, even somebody else recording uh, somebody speaking, then, I mean, it's, it's not very difficult at all. I mean, there's apps right there on the phone that you can get, and even in your uh, camera roll on your phone, a lot of phones nowadays are coming with editors, and you could cut it right there and it's not it's not too difficult at all anymore i mean everyone is a filmmaker in my book a, a potential filmmaker at least yeah it's getting it's getting very popular that's for sure it's uh you know digital means is our current day and our future moving ahead oh yeah now what else did you uh what else did you take from this um what's kind of the main things that you learned from the history delving into this that you just never knew before that really stuck with you i guess one of the big things 
that I guess I learned is that you may not think your lodge has a lot of history, but I can almost guarantee you if if it wasn't founded in the last 50 years, if it goes back further than that, I would almost guarantee you that it would have a huge impact in your community as a whole. Sure. And just no lodge goes uh, that goes that far back doesn't have. Uh, I, let me rephrase that. I I can't see how a lodge that goes that far back wouldn't have a big impact. Right. In, in the community. I mean, that was just one thing that I've that I that I found. I didn't I didn't know going into it that I would even find anything that I would even have a film. But uh, as I as I was looking into, as I said, it'll start making itself. It'll become easier. The hardest part is just taking that step step out and say, "Hey, I'm going to make a film." And that is that first research that you start will be the hardest part. And then after that, it'll start making itself. Sure. Now, what was the overall timeline of this project uh, from you starting out to getting your research to actually jumping in and recording and then the editing portion? How long, you know, total did that take you to put this whole project together? I had the idea um, a year ago this past summer and presented, presented it to the lodge. Now, we didn't start filming until that next January or February. And we just get like some practice shots just to see how we were going to do it. Now, we really kicked it into gear, so to speak, this summer. Okay. So we got a lot of shots, you know, early this year. And then this summer, we really kicked it, in the, kicked it in the, into gear. We knew we had to, I mean, we had to get something going because it was the 100 and 50th anniversary and we had an event plan so we really had to kick it into gear and I had just graduated college last December and uh, I recently got hired but hadn't started my job yet so I had a lot of free time and a lot of time to get it done so I, I would say it took us a little over a year to complete from the idea that I had started right that's what two people so now, how much of that was research? I mean, research is obviously a huge portion of that. Um, oh, yeah. A lot of it, we, I mean, I guess you could say we did it as we went. So if sure. we we found someone that said, hey, I have a lot of information on Portland Lodge, whether or not we knew they really did or not, we'd meet with them, film them, see what they had. A lot of times they brought documents with them, or they even had nice. documents and old aprons that, came from the 1920s we had no idea about wow. and they brought it to us and they weren't even mason they were just something they acquired and they just gave it to the lodge it was amazing Very cool. but um really just as we went we'd record them and things we didn't even know they were going to say we were learning as pretty much as the audience was learning that's awesome so your reason even continued into your recording session as you're bringing these new people in and and getting to have the chat with them you're you're getting more and more the entire time that's great absolutely yeah uh, you said uh, leaving it for future generations I mean this, that's what we're doing is like we would like this to just be a, a, a starting point the end of this film we would like this to be a starting point for you know 50 years from now exactly Exactly. Now to kind of break this into into perspective, because I know there's going to be a lot of guys out there that are going to be very intrigued by this and kind of want to delve into this in some manner. What what equipment did you use? I know you said you used your phone for a lot of the audio. Um, what were you using for video and everything? For video, I have actually I have my camera right here. Um, Great. Now this is a a Canon uh, 6D with a a Rokinon 50 millimeter lens attached to it. And I know if you're not video savvy, you won't know what that means. But really, it's just a DSLR camera with a lens attached to it. Um, that's pretty much what sure. I used. In the beginning, I did not have this camera. I had a little uh, a step underneath it, which is, you know, fine. You, video is video right. in, in my book. So really, you don't have to get top-of-the-line stuff to make top-of-the-line stuff. The only thing that I would say needs to be top-of-the-line when you are making a film is your audio and 
everybody has a phone nowadays almost. So you have it right there. Yeah, well said. And it, yeah, it, it's impressive how well the audios, you know, came through the ages to, you know, be able to get that high quality audio into a phone now. But you're exactly right in saying that. I mean, you can have lower end video. If you have high quality audio, it's going to make the world a difference. You can have amazing video and poor audio and your whole production is just going to come across very cheap and crappy. So that is a great point there. Um, just, you know, giving the guys an idea though of the setup you had to kind of mimic, you know, the look that you got. So we got, you had the, uh, the Canon 5D camera there. Uh, you're using a phone for your audio. What uh, what software are you using to edit this all together? Edit uh, Adobe Premiere Pro is what I use okay. to edit it. it and uh, I use for the majority of this film to cut my color correction. I mean, a lot of time I like to color correct my footage. You don't have to do that. It's not necessary if you're just trying to get the information out there. But uh, I use the effect three-way color corrector or a uh, Lumetri color. Either one of those would work fine. They come with Adobe Premiere Pro. So that's that's, what, that's a like a software that actually does the color correction, not like a, a attachment for the camera or anything. Oh no, yeah, it's not an attachment. Yeah, it comes with the Adobe Premiere Premiere Pro. You just go to your effects rack, um, search for the effects, drag it to the video, and then it'll come up like color wheels. You can get color wheels to come up, uh, but you just go to basic color correction, and you could color correct it right in there. Very Thanks. cool. Very yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. And guys out there, you know, if this is something you're interested in, I, I would say this too. You know, even if you don't have the high-end equipment, if you can get your phones these days, like we've said several times now, take great video. You can get, you can even tweak the settings in there to get better video than normal. But if you can get this together, you could bring a third party in to do your editing. And mm -hmm. it'd be at a, a, a reasonable cost most of the time. I mean, there's so many people out there that know how to do um, you know, Brother Denning could probably help you out or get you with a good source uh, to get that done. But this is such a great way to preserve our history. I know there's a lot of lodges across the uh, United States that are, you know, around their 150 or coming up on an important anniversary now. And these documentaries are great. Not only do they preserve the history for us, but it's on YouTube. And mm -hmm. it's a production, and that's getting out to the public. People are seeing this pop up. They're seeing a production that is of quality and value, and it's putting masonry in a new light. It's bringing us into a new age. So it's definitely something to consider for your lodge, and I hope you all do that. Um, there is a ton of value behind it, and it's going to continue for a long time. It's not just going to be a history book that sits on the shelf and people forget about in 20 years. This is on the Internet now, and when people search your lodge's name, guess what's going to pop up? this video it's so easy to click on and boom you got it right there all that main information so before we get wrapping up brother I want to kind of hand it over to you with any uh, final thoughts or anything you have on this well it was a uh, I guess you, the grand scheme of things it was just a year but during that year I would say the lodge grew so much if you want to get into the to find the essence of your lodge to see where you came from I really suggest that you do at least something like this. You don't have to make a film. Just look into it. See what you can find because I'm sure you'll find more of your family that you didn't even know were Masons in there or uh, friends' family that you can say, hey, I found your uh, great-great-grandfather in the minute books and that might spark interest in somebody else. And, um, yeah, just it's a good – I grew from it, but – the lodge as a whole grew from it too because I mean when you gain knowledge you gain something you can never I mean nobody can take that from you most definitely well brother we want to thank you so much for the the labor and the time and the passion that you clearly put into this yeah. um, you have uh, done wonders not just for your lodge but for the craft in general and I I hope you know that and hope that you see that as it gets out there you know even people from other areas are going to see this and it's going to put masonry in a new light for them. So thank you so much for the labors and everything you put in. Um, I want to kind of give you a chance to give any final plugs and shout outs for a website or social media you have or any way people can maybe contact you to uh, get a hold of you and talk about this a little more. Mm -hmm. um, you can email me, email me at my Gmail account, uh, mitch.denning1 at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook, Mitch Denning, which is... Uh, Search that or MD Films. I'm also on there under that. 
Um, Portland Lodge, number 326, would love to have you follow them. Um, uh, it's ran by a brother I mentioned earlier, uh, Boo McAfee. I'm trying to think of anything else. Uh, my Instagram, <laughs> Mitch Dinning One. Uh, but yeah, uh, other than that, I'm, uh, I'm sure uh, you can give Boo McAfee a, a friend request too. I'm sure he'd like that. <laughs> definitely, but, definitely. Well, I hope I all of you guys it. take the chance to reach out and uh, make sure you connect with the lodge, connect with Brother Dinning. And I can tell you right now, your your history sparked passion inside of this Masonic historian. And I'm. I've got it on my list to get down to your lodge and visit. I've got to see this area and this lodge uh, firsthand to experience that history now. You you did a great job, and we really appreciate everything you've done with it, brother. Thanks, brother, and I appreciate you having me on. You're doing a, a fantastic job on this podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Well, brother, you take care, and we'll talk to you soon. You too. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that today and really took a lot of value away from that conversation. Uh, Brother Mitch is bringing his talents into masonry and putting them to use in such an amazing way. If you guys didn't get a chance to actually watch that documentary, you need to do so. Go to historicallight.com, click on episodes, and go back to episode number 19. We actually feature that documentary within the episode. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you guys are really going to enjoy it. And I want to urge you to consider doing something like that for your lodge. It's not as difficult as you would think. Um, you know, even if it's a little less professional than what Brother Mitch has put together, it's really not that hard to put something together and it's going to look amazing. The technology is getting more accessible at your fingertips. It's getting more powerful and more easy to use as every day goes by. So there's really no reason, no excuse for us not to take this technology and put it to good use within our craft. You know, we've, we've got to modernize in those ways to keep up with the curve. Uh, it's going to keep your lodge's legacy alive and we really owe it to our brothers for that. So definitely consider that. Consider doing something, some kind of a project like this for your lodge to keep your lodge's legacy alive. Um, it's, it's really a great thing. I mean, could you guys imagine flooding the internet with all this history, all this great, positive, impactful history? Um, not only is it going to keep our lodge's memory alive, bring it back to life, but we're going to start overflowing all this speculation and crap out there, all these conspiracy theories. Let's hit them with the truth. Let's hit them here with the history and the positivity of it. And, you know, kindness kills type of thing. That positive's going to go a lot farther than the negative. I know a lot of you guys don't believe me, but it will. Let's flood the internet with the positive, with the history. You know, whether some guys think that, uh, you know, a lot of brothers out there just don't care. Whether you think so or not, just not just the brothers in your lodge want to know your lodge's history. I want to know it. People like me want to know it. Us other history buffs. So share it with us. Let's see it. It's not that hard to do. So I challenge you all. Do some kind of a project like this and keep your lodge's legacy alive. Now we're coming up on the end of the year. Uh, a lot of lodges are going through their uh, elections and installations. I know my lodge, Gardner Lodge, is amping up for that. We got our elections coming up this Thursday, and then we're going to do our uh, installation on the 16th. And it's going to be a really special one because 2018 is going to be our 150th anniversary year. So definitely amping up for that. I'm really excited for next year. I think it's going to be a great one. So if you guys are uh, coming up on a special landmark year like that as well, let us know. Um, wish you all the best. And as you're going into these years, make sure you preserve the history because it's not just you getting you to this point. It's all the brothers before you that built the building blocks that hold up where you're at now. So keep that in mind as you're continuing um, your lodge. Don't forget about your history. Don't forget about your legacy. Promote it and share it with all. So wish you guys the best of luck going into the new years with all your lodges. And we'll go ahead and I'll direct you guys over to the Facebook group. That is the Historical Light Masonic Research Group on Facebook, where we'll continue the conversation for the show. Uh, if you're not a member there, definitely go search it up on Facebook now and click join so you can get on the great conversations going there on a daily basis and for the continued conversation of this episode. All right, so guys, go ahead and jump over to the Facebook group. Again, that's the Historical Light Masonic Research Group on Facebook, and we'll continue the conversation there until next time when we continue our quest for Historical Light. Have a wonderful day.